Hi, I'm Sarah from The Upcoming. So nice to speak to you. Nice to speak to you. Um, thanks so much for taking the time to speak about your film. Maybe you could just kick off with a brief introduction to Danny Legend God um, and what people can expect if they're going to watch your film. Um, yeah, I, I still keep keeping it brief, um, but yeah, it's just a crazy film. Um, it's one that was inspired by another crazy film from back in the 90s. Uh, it's, a, it's a cult classic called Man Bites Dog. Uh, and it really was something that I had not seen before and really inspired me to invest the next five or six years of my life doing something which is not uh, a reboot or a remake uh, or a Bulgarian version of it, but uh, it basically has the same core and an engine, which is like just a um, larger than life, crazy, uh, charismatic, transgressive uh, protagonist. I mean, I haven't actually seen that film, but when I watch it, the first thing that springs to mind is Borat. So, you know, is that another parallel that you can see in terms of creating this kind of larger than life character that, that actually hits upon a lot of the traits that we do see in real life politicians and some of the things that go on in terms of greed and power and corruption, things like that. Yeah, I mean, I wish it, it has like 1% of the, of the viewership and attention that Borat gets. Uh, but I think that's probably as, as far as uh, parallels go because the tone is quite different. Mm -hmm. um, maybe some of the humor is as crude, um, but uh, otherwise, yeah, I wouldn't like. I don't use it as a reference. Um, but yeah, I, I I wish it has at least a fraction of the success that Borat does. Mm. And is it inspired, you know, specifically by? any real life people like for you or is it just you know something that, a character that's completely an amalgamation of lots of things out there yeah it's definitely an amalgamation but it's also definitely inspired by real life as well so so in my in my other profession i work in anti-financial crime here in, the, in in london so uh we see a lot of of real life examples of just ridiculous money laundering and corruption and and, and tax evasion and fraud schemes um, and what's usually represented in, in films is like the good guy fighting the bad guys and the perspective of the good guy or if it is focusing on uh, on sort of the, the bad guys if we want to be like black and white uh, it usually is a little bit more of a romanticized view of them like for example Scorsese movies you, you always like the main guy like the main guy is a bad guy but you like them uh and that's definitely not the idea of, of this film because um you have to be like a real psychopath to like the protagonist of tiny legend god <laughs> or maybe just addicted to the drama that he <laughs> creates but definitely he's not likable and, and you were mentioning just there that you know it's been a, a long journey if you like to you know, have this film come to fruition. So what, what has that journey been for you? And what was it about this type of film that really motivated you to get it from idea to screen? Uh, it's the usual steps, I guess, um, of writing a script, which I'm a very slow writer. So uh, that took a while. Probably professional writers will take like half the time or 10% of the time I, I took to write it. Uh, and rewrite it. Um, then it's the applications to um, co-production uh, markets and to a lot of sort of script competitions and, and stuff, which my personal experience was that that was sort of wasted time. But the only way to know it's wasted time is to actually have a goal um, because you never know what, what can come out of, of some of these things. Um, then it was just organizing the pre-production and then shooting the film. And then actually that after that, the less typical thing was just the added elapsed time of just the whole COVID uh, situation because um, festivals weren't really happening. Um, they were being postponed. Um, we were kind of lucky actually with the festival premieres because we managed to 
show the film in some important festivals and win some awards in the small gap of a few months when festivals were actually taking place physically. Um, before that, they were just being postponed or happening purely online. And right now it's the same. So that was actually kind of a lucky break. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, the other, the other part of the question was what inspired me. It's just, uh, uh, I don't really have an agenda. Like it's not a film that teaches you like a lesson. Not, not that I mind films that teach you a lesson. It's, um, especially if it's, a, if it's a good lesson, but uh, it's, also, it's, it's not like driven by any agenda or anything like that, or just like teaching morals to people. It's just um, something that when I saw the original film, I just thought it's, it's crazy that there aren't more films like that, because to me, there's many aspects to making a good film. You know, there is, uh, you know, the, the typical, um, there are conventions in terms of storytelling, uh, you know, conflict, characters, um, story and so on. And all of these things are important, but to me, like what, what I always remember the longest in a film is the character. It's, I don't really care about the story. Like there has to be a story, otherwise there's no film. But what I remember 10 years later from a film, it's the environment, like the, 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 the feel of it, like the style and the, the, the characters. I don't really remember like what happened first, what happened second, what happened third, and so on. So that's really the, the core of, of the film that inspired this. And that's what the core of, of, of Dying Legend God as well. It's just a crazy character that uh, whatever people feel about him, they're going to remember this guy for sure. If, if they manage to watch until the end. I think it's the kind of film that they're going to either love or hate. <laughs> and it's definitely not a film for everybody, let's say. And, you know, what is it like to make a film in Bulgaria? What does the cinema landscape look like there? I don't know, I was reading, perhaps maybe if you consider yourself a bit of an outsider in, in the film industry there. And so what is it like getting a film made? And also, how do you think a film like this, you know, will be received by um, a Bulgarian audience? Uh, it's been received already quite well, um, considering everything that... Um, you know, the fact that it's mostly in English, uh, which is, uh, you know, um, beneficial for the for world audience, but definitely not beneficial for Bulgarian audience. And then um, also many people may, may feel offended by stuff because they think, well, this isn't like a film that represents Bulgarian in a bad light. Uh, but like I said, like I, I see these things, characters like that and, and much worse in real life every day, like, from around the world. So it's definitely not a Bulgarian thing. Like um, probably happens in Bulgaria more than in, in the UK, but there are other countries where it happens a lot more than in Bulgaria. So it's it's just like you said, an, an amalgamation of, of of like real life people like that, but also of just desires of people who are not like that. But sometimes it comes across their mind like, why am I why am I like the stupid one who is trying to do things the right way? And people like who succeed are definitely not the ones who are like playing by the book and following the rules. So why should I be doing that? Um, you know, so, uh, and then the, the other thing about Bulgaria was like, uh, I think it helped also that people saw it in, in theaters, in, in the festivals. Mm -hmm. So because it's a bit strange, like sometimes people are not sure whether they have to laugh or not. So it definitely helps like if you're in a cinema and like people around you are laughing or at least a few in the crowd are laughing very loudly, then you get the cue. So, uh, so that helped a lot. And uh, I hope like, the um, viewers for, for, you know, for this release uh, online are, are going to watch it in, in groups of two or three so that when it clicks with one of them, then it sort of, uh, you know, we get we get the, the benefit of the of the contagious laughter. Mm. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the way it's been shot because you know you really do feel that it's that you're right there with this documentary team. So you know what how might you have to change your approach for making kind of a traditional film to give it that kind of very um, like like a handheld camera sort of feel to it, like you're right there in amongst the action to get it sort of feeling quite realistic that it's really supposed to be a documentary. Yeah, that was very important because um, it's this could have been done with a few different techniques, like it could have been a voiceover, but I don't really like voiceover that much. Um, 
in general, like it, it works for many films, um, but it also can be really bad. So uh, I prefer this technique so that uh, you're kind of close to the main guy, but you're not in, inside his head. So what that means is you can sort of be his, like you can be happy that you're next to this guy on this journey of an hour and a half and um, experiencing these crazy things like you're right next to him, or you can at one point say, well, that's crossing the line. Like, I don't want to have anything to do with that anymore. Like, I hate the guy already. Um, whereas if you are with, like, the voiceover kind of just keeps you inside the head of this character, it, it's not the same feel as having it, like, in your group of friends, let's say, or, like, you're, you're part of, of, of his entourage. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was difficult to shoot. Like, uh, my uh, director of photography is... A, very experienced documentarian. So he's been to uh, Antarctica a few times and all kinds of crazy places, uh, shooting documentaries and, and documentary series. And he, he's made like 10 feature films as well. So he's very, very experienced. And for him, it's, um, I chose him because he really has that flexibility to, uh, and, and he really can adjust to whatever conditions, like for example, um, a difficult one is when we have to come out of the car because uh, we are like we are supposed to be the point of view of a small documentary crew who are shooting with a small camera. Our camera wasn't actually small, uh, and that was that was a bit more difficult. But the main thing is you have like certain um, you know basically lighting conditions inside the car, and then completely different when you go out and you have like shades and you have sun, and it's basically not a controlled environment at all. And um, on top of that, the, the, the lead, Timo Alexiev, he, uh, in addition to like delivering the lines that were in the script, which is maybe like 90 pages of just his dialogue and, and monologues, he also was improvising all the time. So with what's happening around him. So, so the DOP uh, woman, he, was, he had to be able to just um, sort of guess where the action is gonna happen. Uh, if, uh, if the lead was to improvise, sort of um, move left and right and, and adjust the lighting and um, make sure he doesn't, um, he doesn't include in the frame the, the, the actual boom operator because we have an actor who is a boom op and then, but he's just an actor. He's not actually recording. He has props that look like, like the, the actual boom mic without the mic inside. And then we have the real, boom operator who is actually recording the actual film sound and obviously you can only have one of them in the frame and so there's like so many moving pieces and so many things to think about but in the end uh, I think it works really well and um, it, it really looks like a very well documentary um, like, um, it, it won best cinematography in, in one of the main festivals in Bulgaria as well so it, and it was in competition with of um, you know, some of the best directors of photography that really shot like very art art films uh, like black and white and so on with amazing with amazing cinematography but just I think why uh, why we won with that film and why our, our DOP was um, won best cinematography just they realized how difficult his job was and what an amazing job he managed to do in the end with just um, handling all, all of these uh, these variables and different things coming into the picture. Mm. And you were mentioning there, um, you know, working with, with your cast and, you know, how did you land particularly on your actor to play Danny and how did you work with him? Because like you say, improvising and he just totally embodies this completely, you know, reckless and manic kind of character. So, you know, how, how did you work with him to like really bring that out? I think the job was done before we started shooting because um, we took two years to do the casting for that role. Uh, I had like very specific features in mind that are kind of, kind of contradictory. And at one point I was thinking it's just impossible. Like I've just come up with an impossible character that I can never cast, but it worked in the end. So basically I, want, I, I was very specific about looks, very specific about like um, voice and an and accent very specific, specific about um, uh, his ability to, to memorize very, very long uh, pass, passages of dialogue uh, and about 
basically his general uh, kind of crazy because the character is like the, the Danny is a very crazy guy, but he's not um, he's not uh, sort of a crazy villain type mm -hmm. like the Joker or something like that. He is like a charismatic sort of dark humor, funny crazy. So this kind of crazy was difficult to find, and in combination with all the other requirements as well, it it took like fifty plus people to uh, before we before we landed with with Jimo. And like I said, he did really well in the end because he completely just got the idea, like he understood what, what we want to do. And um, I think it helps that, uh, I mean, he's completely the opposite in real life. He's a real nice guy, but he's just a very good actor. So for him, it's like he got the idea, he learned the text really well. Uh, and I know it helps that, you know, he's a, he's a good driver as well, because many of the scenes, it's like he's driving uh, mm -hmm. in a street that we've not, completely closed so it's not just for the film like there's actual real traffic going on so he is driving he is delivering dialogue uh improvising and he's helping out um the less experienced actors um because you know that's what more experienced actors usually do on on, on set so yeah i really got lucky with him but also it, it did take a while to find him so uh it paid off and it isn't an easy watch not just because he has this, you know, kind of relentless energy about him, but we go to some quite dark places. You know, we see him getting blowjobs, beating people up, being generally sort of quite offensive to everyone, particularly sort of women and things like that. Was that also like part of the point to kind of make it quite shocking? And were there any bits in the filming of it that were particularly funny or particularly challenging to pull off? Yeah, I mean, it does... It it's not, um, it doesn't try to be shocking for the sake of being shocking. Like there's a lot like um, recent and, and not so recent examples of a lot more shocking films in terms of like, you know, babies being slayed and, and th things like this. So uh, it definitely didn't go for like the, just um, the shock effect. Um, uh, usually like these kind of films try to like appease or cater for, for like high and low culture. Like you get the slasher stuff or like the really hardcore, like um, sexual or, or, or violence kind of stuff. And then on the other hand, it's, they try to be like some sort of a deeper analysis or like a, um, maybe a metaphor for something in real life. Uh, so you get kind of both audiences. We generally think about it this way. It's just um, characters like that are usually like this. Um, it's probably a toned down version of many of, of the real life examples, uh, just so that the film can be watchable in the end. Uh, there isn't really anything too hardcore, it's just what a person like that normally does. Mm. It's just trying to be, uh, doesn't try to over-dramatize or, like, um, uh, or like sort of win any audience by just being extremely hardcore. Mm. And you were also mentioning at the beginning there, like, you know, your, your other job, that you are exposed to a lot of this stuff really, happening in real life and I'm just thinking about the fact that right now in the UK we've got all this stuff around our government you know how sleazy are the Tories and it feels like perhaps on the one hand this is happening more than ever but on the other hand there's more of a spotlight being shone on the way politicians behave so do you think even though your film is obviously like humorous and it's very dark humor do you think it also has a bit of a point to make about calling this stuff out and do you think people are trying to hold politicians and, um, and such people to account more. Yeah, and it's, it's a good point that you mentioned politics because specifically like um, Labour Tories, like I'm not very political, mainly I, I basically I think to get to this kind of position, you have to be a certain type. And honestly, I'm not sure one is better than the other, uh, like American politics, UK politics. The difference is that here, like there's a spotlight on, you know, how Boris refurbished, like whatever property. It's like, this is just a joke to like governments in like Eastern Europe or like in other places where we're talking about like, you know, a completely different level of corruption and a lot more obvious. And there's still people who support this, these governments because they're against something that maybe 
doesn't really have any real effect on their life, but they've decided that this is the more important thing in that case. So therefore, I'm going to support this government because they're against that thing that I really hate. But it's something very symptomatic nowadays in politics, like people just have a tribe and like, I'm going to support this, for this uh, whatever, this politician or, or this party, no matter what, just because on certain thing or topic they're with me like, or I'm with them. And otherwise, you know, they can do whatever they want. They can like rig elections, they can refurbish their flats however they want. Uh, they can, you know, do dodgy deals with, with uh, you know, their uh, friends. So um, yeah, it definitely is criticism of, of that, but it's mostly about just, um, it's like the topic is this, but and it and it has a specific character who carries the message, but it could also be just the thoughts of doing these things within normal people like you and I. Like I sometimes think about, you know, like I said, like am I stupid doing things in like trying to do things in the right way when I see that it's not this kind of behavior that makes politicians politicians or like MPs or or ministers uh, or like successful businessmen. It's, it's not like honest uh, work and correct, you know, attitude towards people. Usually, like, of course, there are exceptions, but it's like sometimes you, 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 you think about these things and it's, this film is about um, a person who has a lot of these thoughts and who like lets these thoughts basically dictate what he does in life and, and with those around him. And can you quickly tell us if you already know what you'll work on for your next film, what you're going to tackle? I don't know, to be honest, like this, um, with, as with filmmakers, like all filmmakers, there's a thing that doesn't lack is uh, ideas. Um, but in that case, because it's such a like time consuming and just um, absorbing work and like just the amount of work that, that's involved in making a film, I think this time, definitely not doing it on my own, like, uh, unless I have an produ experienced producer or sales agent on board, like it's just not gonna, I'm not gonna start thinking more seriously about some, you know, specific idea because this one was, I just wanna do this one specific thing. I don't really care if people support it or not, I'm gonna do it anyway. Mm -hmm. But for the next one, um, I'm not gonna do it like that just because, um, you know, it's, it's just too much to do for one person. Um, the amount of work that I did for this film and many people on the crew did uh, is like for uh, the work that usually on a normal film is, is done by, you know, uh, three, or four, three or four people, uh, you know, for, for each role. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I think I'm out of time, but thank you so much for chatting with us and, and for this. Thank you. Very darkly comic, but brilliant film. Um, so best of luck with the release of it here in the UK. Thank you.